the growing pains of change. Just before we go into that, we're going to, at the end of uh, this sermon, spend some time at the altar. I want to invite you to prepare your heart now to respond to the altar. And part of what I preach to you will be that, that you will be willing to grow, to change, to grow. And as you grow in Christ, because we're going to use these two words, growing pains may basically means change, or there's going to be changing pains in growth or growing pains in change. You could flip it either way, take either one, because it's basically going to be the same thing. It's going to say the same thing that God has called us to grow. So God has called us to change. God has called us to change, and that way he uses for us to change is growth. But there's one thing I want to ask you and I to pray about before we start preaching this message, and it's, it's part of the, the way life goes. It's part of the sadnesses, and we're going to talk a little bit about, well, but literally the word pain. Uh, yesterday, uh, I sat with a group of pastors, and the head pastor over us uh, received a phone call that one of our... One of our Calvary Assembly that we support, missionaries, uh, literally just died just instantly of a heart attack. Uh, David Greco, maybe you remember David. He was here not that long ago. I would say within the past 12 months, Sister B, if, if 18 months, seems to me since COVID, or at least we've had him come in. I could be wrong. It could have been, it could be in the past 24 months, but I remember him so specifically uh, standing in the pulpit giving a comment about our, about our church. And, and just not to, not to he, he, wasn't, he wasn't trying to, you know, curry our favor or anything. I think he was just simply saying, just, I like coming to Calvary. It's kind of special. It's just one of the few that I just feel really super blessed in when I come. The people are so wonderful. And so I kind of remember that very specifically. I love to hear those kind of things. You like to hear good reports. And, uh, but anyway, he just instantly passed on, and he wasn't old. He wasn't old. He surely had plenty left in his, in his tenure as a missionary. And so can I ask you to pray for his wife? Her name is Cheryl. He has a son who is a pastor in the Assemblies of God here in New Jersey. His name is Dan. He has a daughter who was an Assemblies of God missionary to Mexico. And literally, as I understand it, uh, David had driven uh, his daughter his son-in-law and their two children to the airport to drop them off to, so they could fly to Mexico. And in their flight, after he got home, he died of a heart attack. And so, uh, you know, you can understand how devastated the entire family is. They are a ministry family. And uh, we're just going to take a moment and we're just going to realize that, yes, praise the Lord. He is in heaven. Praise the Lord. What he preached, what he lived, he now experiences in a great way. But... That doesn't mean that his wife isn't crying tonight. That doesn't mean his son, daughter, grandchildren aren't crying tonight. So we're going to stand with them in prayer right now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we pray for the Grecos. Lord, they were very special to this district. David, before he became a missionary, was our district youth director. And at one point, he was one of our assistant superintendents, one of our uh, helpers to our superintendent. Lord, I just pray that you would bless the family for, for at this time with the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I don't know how to take away the pain. I don't know how to somehow pray away this, this moment. I can't do that. But I can ask you to come and sit beside them, put your arm around them, hold them tight, comfort them, whisper into their ear, their heart, their soul, and just speak to them great things. Lord, I know the body of Christ will be gathering around them. I know they'll have many people. I pray, Jesus, that you will bless the services and viewings and funeral that go on this week. I pray that you'll help them. May we as a church stand with them in prayer. May even tonight, as we pray, may we remember to pray tomorrow and the next day and the next day and for several weeks, I'm sure, Lord, if not months, because Lord, that, that's what it'll take. Uh, that's part of the grieving process. And so, Lord, we thank you. We bless you. We thank you that you are a good God. And we ask again that you take care of the Grecos in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'd appreciate it if you keep praying for him. Well, if you've got your Bibles, you're at Acts, the 16th chapter. Acts, the 16th chapter. I don't know how in the world I'm going to preach this in a... You know what the good part about this is? The countdown to the sermon, or the countdown rather to the service, 
is usually on the overhead. So people know, oh, service is starting in five minutes, it's starting in three minutes, it's starting in two minutes. Of course, my never-ending nightmare is that one day I'll be standing out down the hallway somewhere and the, the camera will turn on and I won't be here. It'll just be blank. Where, where, what happened? You know, can you imagine uh, uh, weeknight news? They turn it on. And now NBC News. And there's nobody sitting there, you know? So we go live online. Absolutely, actually. We schedule it. it it's, it's put into the streaming system and everything else. We are online. So anyway, I don't know how... Well, what I was saying was you get to see when it's good to start, but you don't get to see when it's going to end. That's the part that I get to see. Now, don't anybody turn around and look. I know you're tempted even at this moment. Oh, oh, oh. Or something like that. No, don't do that. Don't do that. Um, because I can just keep going beyond whatever that clock says. So anyway, amen. God says to the church, Jesus said to the church, he's wrapping up. He's wrapping up Matthew. He's wrapping up Mark. Or at least the, the authors of those are, are putting a a period, as it were, at the end of the ministry, the earthly ministry of Jesus. He, is, he has gone through all his ministry. He has died. He has rose again. He gives the final words to the disciples. Go ye into all the world. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to literally every creature you can find, as it were. Meaning every person you can find. Preach that gospel. Because God paid the price for the salvation of mankind. So it's not good that there would be some of mankind that would not get the gospel. So go out and preach it. But here's an interesting thing. Look at it this way. Now we see God as big. We see God as, as just huge. That God has the capability of, of lifting his hand, head. And when he says to the disciples, as it were, Jesus says to the disciples, but God can, we see God doing this. Lifting his head when Jesus says, go ye into all the world. And God is able to, with one sweep of his eyes, see the four corners of the earth. Just see every corner. See the places that don't have Christ and see the places that need Jesus and need a missionary, need a voice to the four corners of the world. And we need that so Jesus can come again. He can do that. God can see that far. Go ye and, and bring the gospel of change. If any man... Being Christ, he is a new creation. So go preach to every creature that it can be a new creation. Every person. And he, he says these things. But you know what else God can do? God, instead of lifting his head and looking to the far regions of the world to say, hey, we need to take the gospel there. We need to take the gospel of, of change and new life and born of the spirit and, and growing in Christ. We not only not needs to go rather far away, but God can take his head and he can kind of look down at Calvary Assembly. And he can say, you know, that's a good church. I'm not saying it's a bad church, angel. I'm not saying it's a bad church. But I think they could use some change. I think they could use a little bit of growth. I think they could use a little bit of fine-tuning, improvement. Maybe a little polish on the old shoe there, as it were. I think they could use it. But you know what else he can do? He can not only look down at a church, he can look down at the individuals in the church. And just to save you embarrassment, I won't use your name. Though I am so tempted to. I just so bad want to, I just want to say, and then I, you know, but I better not. I better not, you know. I, you know, enough people are, well, this whole COVID thing has, I'm not, I'm not ready to have anybody else like, you know, I don't want to offend anybody at the moment, so. I'll just, I'll leave you where you are. But I, I do know that God can be looking at us. So when I say the growing pains of change, I don't only mean the far reaches of the world or, or the, growing, the change that causes growth, but I can talk about you and me. So the sermon is far reaching. And that's the example of the sermon that God was far reaching and wanting to grow the church. But at the same time, that is very personal for you and I. So we're going to ask God to anoint this sermon. We're going to use the story of Acts, the 16th chapter. In Acts 16, God, as it were, lifts his head of that what he commanded them to go ye into all the world, he is about to implement into Paul's missionary journey.
You see, Paul had been circling in Asia. We know the continents. You know the continents of the world, North America, South America. You know, we can go out way out there in Asia and, and on and on and on, Europe and Africa and everything. But Paul was kind of like in that Asia, Asia Minor area. And he was going around in circles. And God said to him, I want you to lift up your head. And God gave him a dream so he would go farther. But going farther, changing, making the, the ministry bigger, making the ministry better, making the Christian bigger, making the Christian better, caused some growing pains. And so let me say to you tonight, I believe God wants you to grow. I believe God wants in that growth for you to change. But I want you to know it may not be easy. There may be some growing pains. Acts the 16th chapter, verse 9. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. And a man from Macedonia, that's northern Greece, Bulgaria, stood and pleaded with him, saying, come on over to, which would we would call Europe. They'd been in Asia, but now let's expand this ministry. Let's go to Europe. Please come and help us. Here's a truth that I want the whole sermon to, to help you get, help me get. In fact, me more than you. Here it is. God has called you to grow. God has called you to grow. This is good. This is very good. Because growing Christians are always going Christians. Growing Christians are always exciting Christians. Growing Christians are always alive Christians. Growing Christians are just the best people in the world. But we could say it another way too. Those who aren't growing. Ooh. Ooh. It's not a good thing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we pray that we respond to your call to grow today. We pray, Lord, that you minister to us. I pray, Jesus, that you anoint this sermon. Lord, there is... I say it so often, but I, I just have to remind myself there's a mystery here. I can review the sermon 10 times. I can reread the, the notes and make sure I've got the scriptures down and everything else. But if there's no anointing, if there's no something in between my words and the person receiving called the Holy Spirit and his, his working and his revealing being the, the, the revelation for us, we're losing out. And Lord, I would say the same. We don't only place the the responsibility on the pastor to have, as it were, an anointed sermon, but we place also the responsibility on the listener, the one seated in the, the chair, that they would pray their own prayer, God, keep me alert, keep me awake, may I, my spirit hear what the, what the Holy Spirit wants to say through this sermon to me as part of the church. We pray in Jesus' name, amen, amen. <laughs> so let me say it this way, health. Health has a certain growth and regrowth factor to it. Any kind of health, any kind of health has a growth and a regrowth. When growing stops, then here's what I, I'm trying to say. You have to wonder if dying has started. If you're not growing, and especially in the context of your Christianity, well, then what are you doing? My wife's father used this illustration so many times. I heard him use it so many times. He grew up in another generation. He grew up in another time, but he would tell a time of taking a wagon. And being a little boy wearing overalls, I don't even know that he was wearing shoes, but I know as a farm boy, he'd take that wagon and put one knee in the wagon and use the other foot to just kind of push that wagon along. Kind of like a, I don't know, kind of a flat kind of scooter, but it was a wagon. You know, think of a, a flyer wagon. And, uh, and, he'd, and he'd say, when you come to a hill, you got to start building some, some speed because you need some momentum to get up that hill. So one knee in the wagon. The other foot down, pumping away on the ground. He said, but this inevitably would happen. If you got halfway up the hill and thought, now nah, I don't need to do anything else. And you stopped pumping, you stopped pushing, you stopped going. You weren't going to even stop. You were going to stop and go backwards. I don't want any of us to go backwards. We got to keep, keep growing in Christ. Can anybody say amen? That's what we're here for tonight. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. You see, growth is there. When you're younger, we call it growing pains. And that's what, that's the title of the sermon. Babies, when they're growing, they get, they get, well, they grow every which way, but they get teeth. 
I've got two grandsons right now in that teething mode. They're getting there. The, the one that's a couple months older, he's got his first two teeth. Well, you know what happens when teeth come in. There's pain, there's crying, there's other things that go with it we won't even mention. And all those things that happen when they start teething. Because why? They're growing. Now, the, the, the younger one, he hasn't got them yet, but he's on his way. He's on his way. He's growing. He's going to have those, the grouchiness and everything else. Even when you grow old, you get new pains. Isn't that amazing? Uh, I wouldn't know anything about that, of course. But, um, but others, others here may know about that. But maybe you're one of those Christians who says, oh, pastor, oh, pastor, don't worry, don't worry at all, because, you know, I've hit the top of the mountain. There's nothing left for God to teach me, show me, reveal to me. Pastor, I've just, I'm just so amazing. To which I respond, I think not. I think not. To which maybe even a church would say, well, you know, we've, we're doing pretty good. We paid this. We paid that. We got this. We got that. We got it all put together. All is well. I don't know that we need to grow anymore. I don't know that we need to really worry about a lost and dying world outside our walls. We're okay. I think we're where God wants us. We've completed the race. To which I would respond, I think not. So what do we need to do tonight? We need to make sure that what we are doing is growing in Christ. And that's the story of Acts, the 16th chapter. Acts, the 16th chapter. Now here, I want to give you a quick reality check. I know that oftentimes we can cheer about something if somebody else is doing it, but we don't get so excited about when we are called to do it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You remember the illustration we use where the guy takes a tightrope, puts it all the way across Niagara Falls, and then he walks across on the tightrope with a wheelbarrow, and then he walks back, and the crowd cheers, and he says, do you think I can do it again? And they go, yes, we believe you can do it again. He says, do you think I can do it with somebody in the wheelbarrow? And they go, yes, I believe you can do it with somebody in the wheelbarrow. And he says, okay, who will volunteer to sit in the wheelbarrow? And everybody just looks at the ground. Nobody is will. You know, we're excited for the church to grow. We're excited. But churches only grow because the people grow. I know that I grow. Your pastor grows. That you as an individual commit with me to grow. And that's, again, what we're shooting for. Growing is part of God's plan. That means there is an element of change. And when there's an element of change, there's an element of pain coming in every one of our lives. Listen, I'll be the first to tell you I don't like change. I am Mr. Reminis. I love the good old days. I, I, I can't hardly get together, and if somebody brings up a story about the good old days... I tell this story. I, I, Sister B, I was telling guys yesterday about Hershey bars for 10 cents and bottles of Coca-Cola for 10 cents. And I was just reminiscing about the good old days. But God is so keen on you and I changing that he gave us one powerful verse from Romans, the 12th chapter. It's not on the overhead, but it says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. By the work of God inside of who you are, your body, soul, and spirit. And isn't it wonderful that God wants to change you and I? Because when he does, great things happen in this world. Great things happen today. They happen tomorrow. They happen next year. Because we are willing to do something, go something, bear some pain of growth for him. I think of the history of the church. I think of, today I think of China. You know whether or not China would ever admit, and I'm not sure they admit about a lot of things, that's for sure. But I can tell you this. It seems like in numbers, about one out of every eight to ten Chinese are born again, and most of them are Pentecostal, born again, and most Pentecostal. One out of eight or ten Chinese in a land that is officially communist, officially doesn't let churches, officially, you know, you're not supposed to have a Bible and everything else, and yet you meet eight people, and every eighth person is born again, and boy, when the rapture happens, is there gonna be an overload out of China? That's like 125 to 150 million people. That's a lot of people. That's so many people. How did that happen? What well, happened because about, well, man, about 150 years ago, a man by the name of Hudson Taylor bore some pain and left his home and he went 
He took his family and he took, and they went to China. Went not just to China to the perimeter, but the inland. And he founded a, an organization called China Inland Mission. And part of that, I'm not saying it was all to his credit. There were many others, but it was a compound effect. He went there and something happened. Was it painful? I'm sure it was. But when you're willing to have growing pains, good change will come for God. I think of Africa. We have many African brethren here. We are so blessed in this church, so overly blessed at Calvary Assembly with many African brothers and sisters from a variety of countries. And think about some of the missionaries that went there. I think of, of David Livingston, who went there and went to the inner portions again, where there wasn't even a map. There was just not a map. If you saw uh, maps of Africa at a certain point in the, or about the mid 1800s, they would have all the countries around the perimeter, but they had no idea what was going on in the middle. And that's what David Livingston went in and mapped it out and took the gospel there. And now, one of the great continents of the world, Africa, is having revival like, wow. Just so many, so, and we've said many times, in Africa, we've got more Christians than we've got churches and pastors. And that's, I mean, in America, we've got more churches than we do Christians. But over there, they've got the, the, the other side of the problem. And that's why we, we invest heavily in Bible colleges there and everything else. But somebody went and paid the price of growing pains. I think of even, even the um, uh, South America and some of the great things, specifically Brazil. And we have Brazilians in our congregation also. And some of the great revivals taking place over the past 50 plus years. And not all of it, but one of them, or part of it, I should say, is one of our Assembly of God missionaries, Bernard Johnson, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, he would have been like the Billy Graham of, of South America. And he preached and, and literally millions came to Christ. And, and again, so many that one, another one of our missionaries, when he was there in Brazil, sat down and said, you know, we have so many pastors who just don't have enough training and enough notes. I need to write a study Bible that they can have that will allow them to have enough teaching to be able to, to give the gospel here. And so he wrote out a study Bible. He finished the last of the notes on it. And, and as I heard the story, he died the next day, but very soon afterwards, if not. And that Bible turned out to be what you and I call today the fire Bible. Somebody went, somebody paid a price. You know, when you're dying of cancer, and he was dying of cancer, Don Stamps, writing the fire Bible and putting it together for us, all the notes, the commentaries, the study part of it. And there was a lot of pain to it, but he was willing to pay the price because it brought change. Did you know our teenagers? You knew this. You heard it a couple months ago. The teenagers at Calvary Assembly of God, every single one of them should have. If they don't, you need to talk to, to Justin or to, to Rachel or, or to Markella. Every one of them should have a fire Bible because we're, we're trying to teach our kids not just to carry a Bible, but to know their Bible. And that's why we want them to know it. So I say all that, and boy, that was a long introduction. I'm sorry, sermon's over. To give you what I want to say to you today about what happened in Acts, the 16th chapter. Acts, the 16th chapter. If we could go to number one, and let's look at change will meet with resistance. So you say, okay, pastor, you, you talked me into it. I mean, man, your introduction like was enough for a sermon. We can just pray now. And that's true. Let me say this. Paul heard God's call. Paul, if you please, was in a Wednesday night Bible study and, and his pastor or the Holy Spirit spoke to him through a dream and said to him, you know what? You got to grow up. You got to change. You got to do something different. You've got to become some great things for me. And I'm calling you to Macedonia. And Paul responded and said, yes, like I trust you respond and say, yes, I want to grow in Jesus. I want that in my life. Well, if that is the case, and I believe it is, then number one, let's see what happened to Paul because I'm going to guess because Bible is the pattern that we usually live out. Paul met with resistance. He crosses, he crosses that part of the ocean there, that strait as it were, and he, and he gets over into what's now called Greece and Europe, and he heads to a, a city called Philippi, which is a major city in the area, and he gets there and he meets a group of people and he starts to preach the gospel and he starts to have effect because God said, go ye into all the world, preach the gospel. 
And when you do, you will baptize people because they will see their need of a savior. They'll come to Christ. So he did, and he was, and things were going good. But the devil didn't like that. So here's the first thing I need to say to you. If you decide to do something for God, if you sit there like a bump on a log, you're gonna have smooth sailing. But if you decide that I'm not gonna settle to be a bump on a log, I'm gonna be a man and woman of God, then you're gonna experience some pushback. Somebody's gonna push back on you. It's gonna be the devil. He's gonna push back on you. Now don't worry about that, but just expect that it's gonna happen. You see, what happened with Paul was he started preaching the gospel and all of a sudden a girl came up and followed Paul and us. And she cried out saying, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Now that sounds pretty good. And look at that verse. If somebody was just stood up and said, hey, this church preaches salvation. This is a good church because they preach the way to get to God. I don't think any of us would go, that person's really bad. We wouldn't, but that's not what this lady was doing. Pay attention to what this lady was doing. These two words here, especially the cried, in the Strong's, it defines this. It defines this word as shrieking, screaming. And this is really interesting. It says cried is, is like croaking like a raven. What does that bring to your thought? Well, the rest of the verse, or the rest of the text, rather, tells us the girl was demon-possessed. She wasn't helping. She was hurting. She was mocking. She was distracting. She was causing weariness, which it, in fact, did to Paul and those preaching. She was bringing resistance against the gospel. You know, it's a big eye-opener, but you would think that when you went and preached the gospel to people, that people would be overly excited that when you tell them they don't have to go to hell and they can, they can literally leave the gates of hell, escape the gates of hell, and they can go into the gates of heaven. You'd think they'd be excited about that, wouldn't you? But here's an interesting thing. Instead of them thanking you and giving their hearts to Jesus, they just turn and walk away from you. You go, that's always been a, a boggle to me. Because it just seems the gospel is so clear. One of the reasons that I got saved, when Sister B shared the gospel with me, one of the reasons I got saved was because it, it just made so much sense. It just was, wow, that's really neat. That is exactly, here, here's my sin, here's me, separated from God, can't get to God, but Jesus makes a way to God. If I go to Jesus, I get to God. And I have salvation. That just made a lot of sense to me. So when it was offered, I praised the Lord. By the grace of God, I received it. But what's so baffling to me is when you share it with someone and they say, no, nah. no. Nah. And of course, all the excuse, it's for you. That's, if it works for you, cool, man, but not for me. You know, it's like a house is burning. A person's running up and down the hallways. Ah, I'm dying. I'm dying. Help me. Show me a way to escape. Here, here's an exit door. Go out this way. No, I don't think so. And they just run back down the hall, screaming and yelling more. Well, what are you thinking? Well, that's literally what happened, as it were, to Paul. To Paul. But it happens all the time. And I just want you to know it's going to happen to you and I as we try to live out the gospel. I like Acts, the second chapter. 3,000 people get saved. I, ho I wish my whole life was Acts, the second chapter. 3,000 people get saved today. 3,000 people get saved tomorrow. 3,000 people get saved the next day. And on and on and on. But you know what? There's more than Acts 2. There's Acts 5. They took the disciples and they beat them and said, don't you dare preach the gospel again. There is Acts, well, there's Acts 7. They stoned Stephen to death. There's Acts 12. They killed James with the, with the sword. There's Acts 14. They took Paul and they threw so many stones at him that they were sure that they were sure that they were sure they had killed him. They stoned him to death, but he wasn't dead. They dragged him out of the city, left him in a dump somewhere, but he got up. There's Acts, the 16th chapter, which we're going to find out here in just a moment, where Paul is beaten for doing what I, for literally preaching the gospel, just, just loving people. You see, there will be a resistance. And while I'm running out of time tonight, I simply want to say this, and I'm going to jump right to number two. 
you know, resistance won't only come from outside, but resistance is going to come from inside too. Sometimes the person who gives you the worst trouble isn't the devil, but you. Uh, I, I, I know that's not a revelation to anybody here. I know nobody's gone. What? what? You're getting a little bit off on left field, Pastor. You know the struggles you have. You know the struggles you have. And, I, and, I'm, and the reason I say I, I skipped that verse, it was Paul in the Romans, the seventh chapter, saying, man, I know what I want to do. I know what I wanna, where I want to go. I know what I want to say. I know what I want to live. But sometimes sin just seems so overwhelming. There is a battle, but he goes on to say, but I want you to know there's victory in Jesus. So you will change. Will, you will meet with resistance. But change, you will meet with trouble. Change, you will meet with trouble. It says then that Paul, that, uh, Paul turns and looks at this girl who is demon-possessed, who is giving him all sorts of trouble and mocking him and all sorts of stuff, and casts a demon out of her. And that's what this verse, and the verse goes on to say then, the next verse goes on to say, now when her master saw that their hope of profit, because they had used her as a fortune teller, might tell you something about these signs as you drive down the highway that are blinking, psychic, weirdo in here. Maybe I've told you this, but uh, when I drive by, I mean, I just say, Lord, would you curse that place? Let's do it together. You know, we can get a few more curses going on here. I mean, you know, I mean, at least, Lord, do something. Uh, there's a place when I drive down to our district office. Used to be one. Used to be one. You'd turn the corner, you'd go around the corner, and there it was. So I did my little, hey, Lord, get rid of that. You know what it is now? Just a flat foundation. I take credit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I don't know what happened, but I just know this is not there anymore. Let's, if that could be for all. But it goes to show you, that's what they were using her for. That's what her demon power was doing. That was it. But now that if the demon power is gone, she couldn't do any psychic work. She couldn't do any psychic work. They got mad. The whole thing again happens. You'd think they would say, wow, you delivered this girl from a demon. Man, you are the best. Here's a hundred bucks. Thank you for taking care of her. But no, it went the other way. Instead, they took them, they beat them, they threw them in jail. Now, I'm going to say it this way. It's not often that we get beat and thrown in jail. That doesn't happen often, I, wouldn't, I would hope. But there are plenty of times, instead of things getting better because of our Christianity, things get worse. And I'll go to the next slide that says, Paul learned that Christianity isn't about living a life with no problems, but it is having a life that has purpose and a call of God in it. Or as we said earlier, living the mission. It's uh, your life's not going to be perfect. That's why I'm trying to say, I'm trying to kind of put forth tonight. There is some some things you'll go through. In fact, here's a verse that you should know well: Second Timothy three twelve. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Wow, what Bible is that in? Oh, your Bible. Oh, yes, that's right. You and I will have a level. I don't know what the level will be. It'll be different in different places. But there will be a level of persecution that come to you and I simply because there will be resistance. There will be trouble. But now, that's, that, if I stopped here, which I should, but I'm not going to, let me give you the other quick part of it. The other quick part of it is, but if you stick with the change, if you stick with the call of God, if you stick with what God's asked you to do, like Paul and Silas did when they crossed over to Macedonia and went to Philippi and preached the gospel and met with resistance and trouble, if you stick with the growing pain and the change, then I can tell you what's going to happen. Good things are going to happen. Because here's what happened. Change responds with praise. So they beat them, they throw them in jail, and verse Chapter 16, verse 25, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. How many of you, even when you're not chained and in prison, sing praises at midnight? I don't know. Well, I, probably I should say, how many of you sing praises at 6 a.m. in the morning? Oh. 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 You wake up, where's my coffee? You know, well, whether it's midnight or 6 a.m. or wherever, Praising the Lord, praising the Lord. You got trouble? You got the devil pushing against you? Don't fall down in a heap and cry and whine and walk away. Praise the Lord. 
lift up the name of Jesus. I, I don't just simply say that because that sounds like a good thing to do. I say that as a biblical pattern of a man who went through intense resistance and trouble and his response was, this is what God wants me to do, praise him. So Christian, praise him, praise him. I, I, I'm gonna kind of go through my, my uh, notes real quick here. Amazing but true, all of us are susceptible to allowing our difficulties to bring on a pity party. You know, I mean, I would have personally, personally maybe, I think if my back was bleeding and it was hurting and I was like, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah, oh, I think I might want to have a little bit of a pity party. Is there anybody who, I, I was so tempted to bring a hat and a well, thing that goes, and all, all those kind of things here for this, this particular illustration, but I'm not Pastor Josh. He's the one who does those cool things. So, but a pity party. We have a pity party. When you have resistance and trouble and life doesn't go the way you want it to go, never have a pity party. Instead, have a praise party. Make sure that you say, Lord, I don't know why, I don't understand, but that doesn't mean you're not still God. When things don't go your way, what, what are the ways they couldn't go your way? You're a young person, you're not married yet, you decide to set a standard for a spouse, you set that standard, a few other guys or gals come along, but they don't meet that standard, so you just say, keep moving, keep moving, pal, I'm looking for somebody else. And you just keep calling on the name of Jesus to bring them, but that person doesn't come in a year or two years or <gasps> years, whatever it is. Sooner or later, you might go, <laughs> I'm gonna have a poor pity party. <laughs> don't do it. Praise God. Whoever he's got for you is so good, it's taken this long to get them ready. Whoa, they are so good. They are so good, and on and on and on. Hey, how about you fall in sin? Just don't lay there and have a pity party. Get up, brush off. Remember, you have a Savior who forgives. Psalm 37, 24, though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down for the Lord upholds him with his right hand. So Paul and Silas don't whine and cry. No, instead they know who called them to the moment and they praise God. And out of their praising God in the midst of what was a big trouble, God came, God moved. Because it says in verse 26, an earthquake came. And instead of the walls falling in or the walls falling out, just the doors fell off. What a weird earthquake. What, everything else is fine, but the doors fall off. It was a, I don't know what kind of earthquake it was. It just was a, it was a, let's call it a weird earthquake. Because another thing that happened was the arms of Paul and Silas somehow shook. I don't know if they had shackles on their feet, but I just know whatever they were shackled with, that fell off. The walls didn't fall down and crush them. Just the rest of it happened. And they stood up. And instead of running away, they still ran to the opportunity that God had for them. That's, that's probably the final point tonight, and we'll close with that. But here's the final point. Um, change responds with truth. They could have run away. The doors fall off. The, it is dark. Remember, because it's later that the, that the prison uh, warden says he calls for a light. Well, if the light, that means he can't really see what's going on. So that would have been a perfect time for Paul to say, Silas, well, let's take a little walk here. Kind of slip out the, out the side, gone. But no, he doesn't do that. Why? Here's it. Lots of Christians run away from the very opportunity that God gives them to do his will. Don't run from that. You know, uh, persecution. Blessed are the persecuted. Blessed are the persecuted. For righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God, Jesus said in the eighth beatitude. And it says in 1 Peter 3, 14, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. Do not be afraid of the threats, nor be troubled. That night, instead of the devil winning, the devil lost. And it really looked like the devil had won. I mean, there was a point where they were so far behind, as it were in the scoreboard, there was no way under the sun they were gonna win. But God has a way of fixing things, does he not? Growing a Christian and growing a church, this is our final slide, there will be some growing pain, some resistance, some trouble, but in the end, let's see that praise and Bible truth will bring the growth that God has called us 
to have in our lives. Would you bow your heads? Heavenly Father, I pray that there would be a desire inside of us to grow in Jesus, to want to draw closer to him, to want to do new things for him. Lord, Paul had a desire to preach the gospel. He's the one who said, woe is me if I don't preach this gospel. But Lord, I, I wonder if he knew what you were going to exactly call him to. You called him to something that was so different, so out of the box change, and there were some pains in it. But Lord, in the end, there was great victory. There was great reward. The souls of Lydia, her family, the souls of the warden's family and the warden, the souls of the church of the people were saved in Philippi, to which we have it literally an epistle for. Lord, the first church in, in Europe. Lord, we know that Europe today needs some more churches, some more full gospel, Jesus preaching churches. Send again, Lord Jesus, your revival like you did at Philippi. Send again your revival to Springfield. Send again your revival to our hearts. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, now it's a moment of response. Now it's a moment of, what am I going to do about growing? Who would come to a church on a Wednesday night? You got 325 million, 350 million Americans. I don't know how many of them go to even church on a Sunday morning. Who would go to church on a Wednesday night? I think I know. People that somewhere inside of them, inside of, inside of who they are and what they have decided to be a priority in their life, they want to grow and grow and grow in Jesus. That's why I believe you're here tonight. And because of that, I want to challenge you. Royal Rangers and Girls United won't be over for another 20 minutes. I'm going to challenge you to take those, that time to pray for growth. There are other things you can pray for, I'm sure, but if you would, first and foremost, pray for growth in your life. And then pray for what it takes. The, well, what, like we said, what Paul and Silas had, the willingness to stand up against resistance, to stand up against trouble, so that the ultimate victory can be for Jesus. I'm going to pray, then I'm going to invite you to the altar. Heavenly Father, now we've preached it, we've taught it, we've enjoyed it some, Lord. Now we just need to pray about it. It needs to be who we are. Help us tonight, Lord. Bless us tonight. Minister tonight around this altar, in these, in these pews, so that, Lord Jesus, your house of prayer will be prayers that have gone up to the throne, petitioned God, and now the answers have come back, and those answers then get in their cars and go all over this part of New Jersey. We thank you, Lord. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wednesday night, altars are open. If you can, use your knees at the altar. Use your knees up there. If you can't, fine. Sit in your chair. That's good too, but pray. That's, that's what, really what we're calling you to. But we do believe there's something good here at the altar. Come, let's pray together.